Good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Watson. I am a senior fellow with the Danube Institute here in Budapest, Hungary, and we are delighted to uh, to welcome a new guest uh, to our podcast today. Uh, please uh, wel- help me welcome uh, Mimi Roy. She is a visiting research fellow at Ludovica, the University of Public Service. And today we're going to have a, a little discussion, a little chat about India. And this is about India specifically at the intersection of national power, global politics, and advanced technology. Mm-hmm. And today, uh, in that context, uh, Mimi's going to talk to us really addressing a central question, and that is how India's tech strategy is relevant in the new era era of techno competition, and specifically how India is attempting to emerge as a prominent stakeholder in shaping the global narrative around technology. Wow. So Mimi, thank you for coming. I have to say that's quite a quite a big topic and uh, quite a quite a mouthful. So I understand you've been here in Budapest for the last three months uh, writing this research paper. And we look forward to hearing uh, what your focus is and the answer to the this really compelling question. So with that, um, please uh, please let us know uh, how you'd like to uh, address these questions and we look forward to hearing your response. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Michelle, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Um, I mean, uh, you are uh, one of the authorities on technology and uh, very inspiring as a person and as also a you know, expert. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and, um, you know, discuss this. And um, also, I uh, intend to learn from you uh, in the coming uh, future. I mean, beyond this podcast also. Uh, As of uh, my work uh, around, uh, you know, on technology as a visiting fellow, uh, I kind of, uh, if you look at the uh, the 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 title of the paper it is india in the intersection of global politics national power and advanced technologies basically uh, there are three aspects to uh, here i mean and the uh, you know and the first is the global politics part the f- second is the national power part and the third is the advanced technologies part so let me first address that number one uh, when it comes to global politics uh, it, uh, before that, uh, you know, I mean, in the context of technology, it is emerging as a very important element in the in the power dynamics in the world, and uh, it is also a parameter in global competition. Given that you yourself, you know, you have worked so much in Washington D.C., you are very well aware about the emerging technological competitions, especially between major powers and how the ramifications has been mm-hmm. worldwide. Mm-hmm. So uh, actually, the uh, the the motivation of my uh, research work came from this, uh, you know, this uh, long-standing discussion, debate, and uh, a lot of writing around this uh, uh, this entire concept and how it has opened opportunities for different countries in the world uh, who are also uh, who can be very important nodal point of supply chain diversification absolutely yeah. and uh, so that that answers the you know the global politics part of the paper when it comes to the national power and advanced technologies here basically i try to uh, address that how india is equipped to be even uh, you know there and address uh, uh, this uh, you know and 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 claim or rather uh, you know aspire to be one of the nodal point of uh, supply chain diversification using its own assets and capabilities and its you know uh, own aspirations through which it is drawn building policies it is uh, chalking the outline uh, to be there to shape the narrative so uh, that's uh, how you know india is in the intersection of the global politics which is broadly the technological competition the national power and the advanced technologies where i talk about specific technologies being in the forefront of india's technology journey here yes yes and uh, we're, we're going to get to those key technologies in a little while um yes yeah. yeah, so so another thing that you talk about uh in your paper is this great concept called Vishwa Guru. Mm-hmm. 
yes. uh, the teacher of the world. Yes. This I found very fascinating. Okay. But it it is a it is a central strategy yes. uh, uh, throughout uh, India, not just technology. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it pertains to the importance of uh, your paper? Uh, so India has, uh, you know, I mean, uh, while it is. Uh, it has expanded the horizon of its foreign policy outreach, growing its clout and, um, you know, um, uh, and uh, definitely having the ability to shape the narrative. It has these concepts of facets, different facets, which presents its, its, uh, its uh, you know, story or presents its profile of being, uh, you know, an open uh, country towards, uh, you know, uh, towards building partnerships, strengthening its friendship. Vishwaguru, and also I will talk about Vishwamitra. Uh, Vishwaguru is uh, called the teacher of the world. And Vishwamitra is about the uh, friend of the world. So, uh, so India aspires to be not only while it is building the friendships uh, and, as, and, you know, come across as a friendlier nation towards others it also wants to be uh, wants to share its knowledge which is not uh, it is not uh, concerned only about technology but it has a lot of other other you know pearls in its in its bouquet there are a lot of facets about india which it can share with the world so that's how you know this entire vishwaguru was uh, brought in not to not from a very assertive point of view to teach the world, actually, you know, teach, teach, but actually sharing its own wisdom and knowledge about mm. its, uh, about different facets, how it is, you know, looking at things, how it, what is its lens and how it wants to, you know, pursue that. So that's mm. how it is, uh, it was conceptualized. Yeah, I, I thought that was fascinating, especially since, uh, you know, I've worked in technology for a few decades now and, and, and with uh, India quite a bit. And India is known as a technological uh, hub, uh, but also a technology leader yes. in many aspects. So this concept, uh, I think, applies very nicely to, to technology. Um, so uh, also, you, you mentioned a bit about the digital public infrastructure yes. uh, in, uh, in in your paper and in, and in central, obviously, to answering the this central question. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? What what is uh, DPI? And um, you also talk about uh, UPI, the Unified Payments Interface, mm -hmm. as part of the DPI. Yes. And I'm 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 sure we're all anxious to know that because this is a success story, mm -hmm. uh, clearly for India, both nationally and internationally. Can you tell us uh, what these terms mean and how it's integral to the strategy of of India's technology advancement? Yeah, I mean, uh, while strategizing technology to uh, um, build its global outreach among the many other strategies or many other uh, facets uh, i think india has uh, followed a two pronged strategy to you know take its technology journey or its knowledge or its uh, you know its growth outside the borders and also uh, also commercialize it uh, commercialize it and also earn from it generate revenue uh, develop its commercial potential, make it more economic viable, viable as well as using it for national security. Mm -hmm. uh, so for that, it has done. Uh, you know, it has followed uh, two kinds, two, uh, two, two, per, uh, two perspective or two uh, roadways or two prongs. I would say mm -hmm. one is uh, that is uh, globalizing its digital public infrastructure technologies meant for ease of living for people. So here it is about uh, you know. These are very basic, like uh, these are very basic uh, apps. There are basic apps uh, which are uh, introduced by the government so that, uh, in, uh, I mean, people can, uh, you know, easily uh, make, uh, you know, this identity verifications, make payments or even, you know, manage data. So there are these very easy, uh, easy, uh, you know, ap applications which are easily available to people through phones. And um, they can make a payment in a 
like you know in a moment or maybe like you know they need some kind of or maybe they are opening an account or maybe they are doing some kind of transaction where they need some kind of verification so there are so this is a you know this is a uh, there are these different kinds of uh, digital applications which uh, are meant for easing the life of people so this has been branded as digital public infrastructure uh uh for also exporting it out of the you know out of the uh, country and uh, commercialize it and also not only commercialize it but also to share its own uh, knowledge uh, base about how uh, you know how in the like even a, in a country of 1.4 billion where you know i mean uh, to make it time efficient cost efficient how it can be used easily so a lot of countries have come up and uh, have adopted it uh, philippines uh, other kind of countries of southeast asia some african countries uh, morocco even you know upi was introduced in uh, in the one of the bouquet options of uh, france i mean mm-hmm. euro and remind us so remind us what upi stands for the upi is un- unified payment system i mean uh, where you know you uh, can just uh, for in india i mean if i'm traveling in a met- uh, traveling in a in a in a public transport or i'm buying something or even if i'm buying something for like 1 euro or 2 euros even if i'm uh, buying something for 50 cents like translating it to indian rupee mm-hmm. then i can make those even the smallest amount of transaction i can do it with upi you know it's that easy i have to just there is a qr code i look at it i mean my phone scans it and the payment is done within seconds so that's how uh, you know that 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 is uh, upi then we have this uh, uh, aadhar which is our uh, uh, you know we have a 12 uh, 12 digit identification number mm-hmm. and uh, for traveling for you know booking tickets or for even bo- um, uh, opening an account we need these uh, so uh, so previously there used to be different kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, you know uh, identification verification proof that you need yes. so now all this uh, all these different kinds of identification proof has been uh has been condensed and has been brought under one umbrella and if you have an aadhar number you can just easily do your verification citizenship verification i see i see so it yeah. sounds like india has taken of course this digitalization of the public infrastructure every country in the world realized yeah. especially after covid yeah. ha- had to be done and accelerated so it sounds like india has done this and packaged it as not only a a, a, a capability uh, offering in in india itself but you have uh you Offered have sent it yeah. around the world and it is something you say you commercialize it so you're commercializing it as a global provider yeah. of uh like an already put together digitalized um uh, identity verification and payment uh system yes. that you're providing to countries around the world yes. i see and i you know i mean i will just uh, try um, want to add that uh come like you know a, with as a country of 1.4 billion mm-hmm. i mean and everybody is in a rush hush uh, you know so to make something very time efficient cost efficient is uh, you know is very uh, very important mm-hmm. and um, and also this is also i mean something which can be added very gladly very proudly to the entire na- of you know of india's way of telling its own technological journey and sharing it with the world sharing with the world about its own wisdom about how it has done it and it is not easy i mean you know so i mean it developed it it um, people accessed it and now i mean it it has actually become so easy that anybody even the smallest vendor uses or even the largest transactions happen in the same payment route i see so that is something which is very commendable Uh, that is very uh it is very commendable and is there can you give us a sense of like what percentage of the india population as you say uh, 1 1.5 billion people 1.4 billion 4 billion i think um, oh, yeah i think much, more than 98 or 99% i don't know the percentage i haven't checked actually but uh, i mean i would say that a lot of people i mean i don't want to really claim the right percentage or even uh, say an 
approximate number right now because I really haven't checked, but it is definitely checked by the, by, uh, like it is used by majority of the people across the spectrum, across the layers, across the economic classes. So not, not just businesses, obviously. Not at all. But right. citizens. So economic to, to classes, yes. I see, I yes. see. That's, that's fascinating. Um, so the, the other thing we talked about is, uh, and you mentioned before about uh, India's key technologies. Yes. And of course, you know, as we say, India has been a leader in technology in many aspects for many decades. Yes. So um, I'm particularly interested in, in hearing kind of how you have, what, what you're summarizing as today's key technologies in India, both internally uh, to your nation and then uh, providing uh, to the rest of the world. Okay. Um, I uh, So there, there comes the second, uh, you know, part of the paper, which is about how to use, that is about the public, for the public, but also how to use advanced technologies for, uh, you know, and choosing them and selecting them and enhancing and uh, cultivating uh, them for not only for national national security purpose, but also, uh, uh, you know, grow their economic potentials and build uh, and make them, uh, you know, uh, um, like uh, an element of uh, building strategic uh, partnerships or friendships with other countries. So, um, I mean, this, uh, you know, this uh, table which you see, it has been, it's not, I have not framed it. I got it from a research paper uh, on India's technology strategy and I found it very useful and uh, it definitely tells the story of how India is prioritizing certain key technologies based on their economic potential, their employment potential, uh, and their potential to build uh, strategic partnerships with other countries. And um, as and uh, you know, I mean, some of them are the defense technologies, semiconductors, artificial intelligence, space technologies, biotechnologies. These are uh, very important. Uh, and if you if you uh, if you tell, see the story of any country, small, big, or medium, these are certain common, you know, uh, you know, uh, technologies which are being uh, used or being uh, heavily invested in, um, you know, in the strategic trajectory uh, in the world. Yes, yes, yes. And India has already started working on it and it ha it is adopting different kinds of, um, you know, uh, I mean, methods to, uh, so that, you know, I mean, it doesn't only, while it prioritizes it, it can also promote it. I see. I see. Can you can you recap those? I think that is that four or five uh, that you mentioned uh, uh, of the key technologies today. Yeah, I mentioned uh, certain uh, you know key technologies based on uh, the based on my research on how you know the, the, you mean. I mean they have been heavily invested on, or uh, you know the R and D has started. Yeah. But and what, can you tell us what, what these are again? So AI for sure we know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, yeah. Okay. The thing is that, um, you know, I mean, uh, so every technology that is mentioned, for example, defense technology, uh, defense. If you, yeah, if you come to it, uh, it is about, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, India has this policy of make in India and make for the world. Yeah. So, uh, so while it is, it wants to be self-reliant in the defense modernization, like Hungary has also pursued it. It is also trying to be a you know manufacturing hub for the world mm -hmm. because it has the it ha it is building the right kind of infrastructure so that it happens so that it not only not only makes it a you know a market or a potential uh, you know I mean very important uh, nodal point in the supply chain mm -hmm. but also it can emerge as a manufacturing hub in the in the in the future. So it has for uh, defense. For defense. For sure. Can so, you give us an example? Uh, like, I mean, um, a, a defense technology that uh, India leads on today. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, it has just uh, you know, I mean, it has it is uh, it is just uh, it it has just uh, signed some kind of these manufacturing deals mm -hmm. uh, with Spain. And uh, it is it has some category A and category B. Uh, I will just mention. I will just uh, 
little bit of uh, yeah so uh, the thing is that um, so uh, the thing is that india uh, wants to um, has its own uh, it has own uh, you know uh, technology bouquet which it wants to promote for the technological transfers i mean it can be drones it can be it can be aircrafts uh, so i mean different kinds of things it's it, it has started building uh, with in joint ventures and it also want to come up heavily you know uh, you know on on things which it can build indigenously but it wants to be also the manufacturing hub uh, for other countries i see so things like um, actually n- not just designing and, and the, the technology that goes into drones yeah. or or other defense aircrafts um, i mean it is it will it has just signed a, a, an agreement with spain to uh, to to provide aircraft to, so to military build aircraft. a joint uh, aircraft like in under the joint venture uh, i see uh, thing so the thing is that uh, Uh, the th- uh, so there are certain uh, it has it has certain um, you know technologies which it wants to keep it for itself and it uh, doesn't want to get into the technology transfer because it is also one of the uh, key points of building strategic partnerships outside sure. and uh, second is that it uh, wants to also uh, you open uh, some of them and commercialize them so yeah so it's uh, so it has already signed some uh, very important uh, collaborative agreements on uh, with the us with the uh, uh, with uh, uk and australia and japan so yeah so so yeah so you're providing um defense um products not uh is drones uh, uh, drones planes is it also like tanks and all kinds of aspects or military or are there certain products certain military um uh, equipment that is provided by india no i mean um, india is also the biggest exporter of defense uh, it's not that it's very self reliant mm. it it will take some time to be completely self reliant but it is one of the biggest importers so for i mean it also imports uh, the largest amount of um, you know in fact uh, arms it imports from russia and france yes. uh i mean th- i think 36% or 33% of its uh, requirement is it it imports from there um uh, but uh, but i mean uh, it's uh, it's building up it's still building up its infrastructure and it uh, intends to expand i see i see can you give us an example of some of the other key technologies uh then the next one you mentioned one very near and dear to my heart too is uh ai artificial intelligence mm-hmm. we see every country wanting to um invest in this and try to expand the capabilities both within their own country and and uh globally can you give me an example of success story of how india has is investing in ai yeah so i mean it has come up with an ai for all strategy and ai ai for all yeah it I has like a that. national strategy of ai for all and basically you know in any of these uh, technologies if you talk about whether it's defense whether it's um, semiconductors or artificial intelligence or even biotechnologies mm-hmm. the thing is that it is uh, trying to do it um, for um, i mean for the example artificial intelligence is something which can be used in which has different kinds of applications it can be have military applications it can have civilian ex- applications so it want these applications and these uh, implementations to be uh, to be to be uh, av- available and also so that people are more informed about it people are more educated about it so that's why it came up with this national strategy of ai for all and um, and uh, not just that it wants to uh, expand the r&d i mean research and development which is it is already expanding and it wants to uh, you know reduce the gap between the industrial uh, industrial applications mm-hmm. and the and the and the uh and the uh like the application and the research and devel- development uh course uh and also it has uh, encouraged a lot of uh, private uh, participation by 
actually inviting a lot of private uh, startups to be a part of uh, this entire production process, application process, implementation process, so that it doesn't only takes the takes the you know the quality of these things uh, ahead, but also generate employment. I see. And is that, and are those private uh, companies uh, just in India, or they are they could be private sector companies outside of? Yeah, India? yeah. If they well, if there are countries outside uh, who are interested from outside the, I mean, uh, India, then uh, for that, uh, you know, they have come up with this uh, PLI scheme, um, where you know, I mean, uh, the government will subsidize a certain amount of your production cost or your input cost, and then they will have set targets and so that you know uh, uh, so there is a lot of discussion about that ease of doing business is a little you know I mean India is a little have, has a, ba- a little back foot you know uh, because of there is a lot uh, there used to be a lot of bureaucratic red, tip- red, red tapeism and uh, the, the 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 web is being clear, cleared and cleaned and it's things are de-escalated I mean uh, the easing process is on so they want uh, that um, uh, so they have coming up with policies so that uh, out stakeholders from outside the country also get uh, interested and they also come in and invest and they feel encouraged uh, that you know okay i mean we want to be uh, the part of the you know entire narrative building and also we can be uh, we can be a stakeholder there I see. So it's a truly a public-private partnership where government and mm-hmm. industry organizations yeah. work together in in the providing of these key technologies. Yeah. So it's private G two G and also private to private, also government and private. So I mean, uh, so the lot of information desk and lot of uh, interaction processes has been opened so that you know these things can be eased out. Sure. I'm not saying that you know it has it has gone out there. But it is now creating a condition so that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, more and more it can become uh, open to such possibilities, such, um, such uh, you know, prospects. So, yeah, it's, it's how it is. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So, um, y- you also mentioned semiconductors and biotechnology. Well, first of all, uh, the whole world, especially uh, Silicon Valley, knows how uh, India has led in semiconductors, again, for, for many decades. And as a matter of fact, I can think of, of several of semiconductor uh, leaders in Silicon Valley uh, come from India. So, how is the, uh, the semiconductor technology um, industry in in India, how is that growing and becoming? Uh, you talk about becoming a, a, a greater uh, a greater partner um, in the supply chain. How how does that? How does the semiconductor industry in India today uh, look in terms of uh, being uh, in the supply chain, but also a provider? Uh, from your own semiconductor companies. Yeah. So India has come up with these, uh, you know, different programs like India's Decade Chips for Viksit Bharat Initiative, India Semiconductor Missions. Mm. So uh, it is, uh, these are specialized and in, uh, so Indian Semiconductor Mission uh, to be very precise, is a specialized and independent business division within the Digital India Corporation that aims to build a vibrant semiconductor and display ecosystem to enable India's emergence uh, as a global hub for electronics, manufacturing and design. Uh, then then there is this India's Decade uh, Chips for Viksit Bharat initiative that ensure India can maintain sustainable development, create new jobs, improve quality of life and establish a permanent presence in the global technology landscape uh, and in india in march 24 uh, 2024 india launched uh, its semiconductor fabrication facility at Dore, uh, at in gujarat and um, in gujarat and in assam so uh, yeah so it is building these uh, facilities also so that i mean you know it while it is it wants to uh, want wants to uh, 
you know, I mean, present its case. The facilities are there. It is already growing. It's, uh, you know, it's already uh, building its facilities and that will encourage and attract more investors and uh, take uh, its, uh, you know, the pitch seriously. Mm -hmm. So how uh, this is, uh, they are doing it. Uh, They have also signed memorandum of understandings with US, EU, Japan, Singapore and Taiwan. Um, so, very, very successful and growing, I hear. So, yeah. so in these semiconductor um, projects, uh, it's both with the government and uh, and private sector companies, uh, both w- with uh, within Japan and and many other countries. Yes. I, I know of some successful ones with the U.S. Um, yes. Particularly, have been going on for for many many years. Yeah. Um, that's that's uh, i mean you will understand it more because uh, you know i mean uh, for me attempting to write on technology is has been uh, like you know i'm a starter and i'm still exploring and there are a lot of key technological terms which i don't really get uh, when uh, there are know, many yeah. yes so i mean sometimes i uh, i read them you know from a very uh, literature point of view um, and sometimes uh, you know the technological part i have to really go and google and you know try to understand a lot of these you know terms like fabs and yeah. yes so sometimes i mean you know it takes uh, a little i mean i'm i'm i'm, I'm still uh, i'm still uh, building my uh, my understanding on those uh, technical parts and i understand that i mean now i understand that writing a paper on technology also needs you to have uh, also some basic knowledge about the technological aspects of these key technologies sure sure yes so yeah yeah, and the, the fourth, uh, the fourth technology, key technology, you talk about biotechnology, yeah. and I know this has uh, also been a great success story for India mm-hmm. and is growing quite a bit, especially since uh, since COVID yeah. and the the look to to um, implement uh, and integrate other countries uh, into the supply chain because we realize it's important to have um, biotechnology sources in many places around the world. Can you talk a little bit about the success story of biotechnology investment uh, into and within India? Look, uh, I would, uh, when you talk about the uh, success story, I mean, uh, this was asked to me before uh, and I will say that India itself is investing a lot in from its own, uh, I mean, first it is trying to invest itself, uh, you know, to build the facilities, to make them attractive, enhance their capabilities and pitch for it. So the investment story or the success of the investment story is yet to happen. It's yet to come. And I mean, that has to build up, you know. Mm-hmm. After mm-hmm. India successfully pitched it, I mean, I will not uh, go into something like a success story just because I want to glorify it. I see, but it has grown quite a bit. I understand in the last. Uh, yeah, what I ma- what how I look at you know when I present the case of any key technologies is India is trying to grow its you know it's uh, grow its pitch uh, it is trying to develop its capabilities it's uh, it is trying to develop its cap- capability to tell a success story and pitch it uh, for the win so that more stakeholders uh, you know inside or outside the country is interested and uh, understand the 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 utility and the and the importance of investing in it so i would say that you know when it comes to any of these technologies we have discussed the right now it is in the building up stage stage right now it is um, building up different kinds of policy programs so that uh, i mean when it comes to biotechnology it has this bio e3 uh, policy it has bio right these are for you know increasing employment developing the R&D of the country mm-hmm. and also, uh, you know, open it and, and also to pitch it for, uh, you know, more uh, so that more startups come and, you know, also more employment happens. So these are all in the building up stage. Uh, and uh, I, w- I, won't, I think that uh, rather than talking about the success story we would uh, we should uh, you know I mean how we should look at it is how uh, India is trying to build uh, you know pitch for a success story Mm -hmm. 
I in the future because these are still building up india still doesn't have a you know a an a, a, a unified policy to deal with uh, deal with this uh, you know these key technologies the enhancement or its aspirations to uh, to export them commercialize them or to build strategic partnerships. I see. So it's they're still building the strategy, yeah. uh, unified strategy. Is that part of what you mentioned the supply chain? No. Uh, how I will explain it a little bit. The thing is that uh, India has uh, since its independence, it has it uh, did come up with different kinds of policies under the umbrella of like in for science and technology and all. Some uh, so it, it has grown in different stages. Sometime it uh, I mean at one point it was about developing the foundations of science and technology then it became that you know okay we will do it for ease of living i mean at that point at in that uh, then we will build up the foundations i mean iits were in, introduced different kinds of uh, you know uh, disco, uh, like things were shaped up i mean policy infrastructures were uh, introduced so that you know india starts to uh, start to uh, you know um, start to take science important, like science and technology in an important way because it is STEM, very... Like STEM yeah. education? Yeah, I mean, its application is extremely important in every aspect of life. So, uh, so there were different sta stages of these policies. So now the stage, st uh, statue is, status, uh, status is that in 2020, um, government came up with this uh, entire, uh, you know, initiative of uh, a policy formulation which caters to the current discourse requirement or aspirations or aim of its technology and innovation journey so for that it has created certain uh, certain um, uh, you know certain um, um, groups i mean uh, like you know i mean uh, there is like a certain uh, what i would uh, what i should say the right word yeah, to like you know expert committee and um, who will not only who has to take feedback from the industry, from the research uh, community, from startups, from the experts and come up with a holistic formula, like, you know, policy formulation. Right now, to while you deal with as an when you are outside India and if you like you yourself, you are an entrepreneur. And uh, if you want to, OK, I want to invest in this uh, specifically, maybe I need to invest in. Uh, artificial intelligence or maybe uh, defense technology, then you have to go through a certain ministry or certain desk mm -hmm. and you have to inquire with, uh, you know, a certain particular uh, strata to understand what are the, what are the requirements, uh, how, what is the government's, uh, you know, PLI scheme for this and all. So uh, right now it's a little bit fragmented. And uh, that's why I said that to go to discuss about success story, first we have to be, you know, very sure about how things are on the ground. And now on the ground, it is just building up. I see. So what you're saying is that <clears throat> all these policies are being implemented yeah. to make stronger the, the strategy. The foundation to grow and even policy more. infrastructure mm -hmm. so that it can make a pitch for a success story. I see. And uh, I mean, all that, I mean, when I talk about Vishwaguru or India being, a, you know, how to it can shape the narrative, it is more about its aspiration and aim and objective or goal right now. Mm -hmm. And there is a, uh, you know, there are a lot of things it needs to, you know, I mean, put together, uh, like maybe a more mainstream uh, politic, uh, policy, you know, discourse, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more unified approach towards key technologies also explain to people how the, it is prioritizing the key technologies and how uh, you know I mean it is open for uh, you know how open, like you know how people can participate more uh, while it is trying to commercialize and generate employment so right now India is doing all that and the government is extremely uh, extremely uh, uh, I mean uh, you know I mean um, the government is uh, very uh, very uh, information available. I mean, all the informations are available. And uh, I mean, it has also, I mean, my own friend uh, who has a different startup, he had done some kind of work with DRDO. Um, with, with who? With DRDO, which is the Defense Research 
uh, organization of the in, country, in India. In okay. India. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, it is being done, uh, but my friends are also planning to do more work. They are like all physicists mm -hmm. and they don't want to teach and they want to explore and do hardcore research, mm -hmm. which... Uh, which contributes to the national security and, um, you know, more uh, more uh, as a straight or a straight-jacketed uh, stakeholder in the entire discourse. So, uh, so there is a lot to be done, you know, uh, building up these uh, policy uh, policy things, straight-jacketing the roots, uh, and and build the right infrastructures. Following the policy introductions, there is a lot of things that is on paper that has to be done. And also ensuring, which is the most important thing, that uh, while they are aspiring to do friendship, I mean, build up strategic partnerships, mm -hmm. to have the right conditionalities in, in the agreements and the right, um, you know, business circumstance or conditions so that, uh, I mean, you know, external powers or external stakeholders find it more uh, comfortable to look at India as a potential to, to invest market. in India. Yeah. But also, and you talk about also, so other countries, uh, you, you want to develop the policies and then the partnerships so other countries don't take advantage of India as well. You yeah. Know, you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I was talking about, uh, you know, the value system yes. uh, that uh, that there is a lot of talk about technology sovereignty mm -hmm. and uh, India has not really uh, you know said anything very big about technology sovereignty except for in uh, you know uh, we have seen reports on data sovereignty where India wants to be more in charge of data flow and data management yes. so the thing is that uh, uh, the government it's not it doesn't uh, promote any kind of pro protectionism but it doesn't want, want any third party or adversaries to be, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, unbounded data flow or an, a very open policy. Yeah. So, I mean, you understand the vulnerabilities of, you know, the, the, the extent uh, the vulnerabilities can happen when it comes to any kind of technology and what kind of implications it can have on um, not only at a larger scale of national security, but also the internal security of the sure. country. I mean, just imagine, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not interconnecting, but if you don't have the right, uh, right way of deterring uh, the information on, uh, you know, maybe in your defense technologies and there is some, uh, you know, drone or robotic armament being used in the border mm -hmm. and the enemy, la enemy has the, or any adversary, I won't use the word enemy, but any adversary sitting in one corner of the world from one computer uh, takes control of, uh, you know, your armament or your um, your, uh, uh, I mean, your weapon. Then it's a hybrid warfare, and you are literally vulnerable to an invisible enemy. Exactly. You talk about um, you know, the data management and the data ownership of your own data is very important, as yeah. you say, to national security uh, for every country. Yeah. But I see where you know India is making a push, and and presumably have had implemented. Uh, New policies in order to uh, to maintain the integrity and ownership of this data. Yes, yeah, that wasn't just an example, and I'm, I'm, my argument is that you know, uh, you know, taking having some control over your data is not protectionism, protectionism, but right. uh, but it's def deterrence and self protection. Oh, absolutely, uh, and and a and, crucial part of yeah, national security. Yeah, and while it has made it very important, very clear that we want to not only make in India but also make for the world so mm -hmm. it is very open for outside investment mm -hmm. and it is uh, it is going to be open minded while it mm -hmm. it deals with uh, uh, stakeholders from outside the country i see so yeah in some of this data processing uh data management and uh, uh yeah data uh, providing data services to outside uh, India. This is where India provides these capabilities, and, but yet the outside countries or companies still own their own data. Mm -hmm. Yes, you don't want to own data that belongs to other companies and countries, correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. And uh, I think... Uh, 
I mean, I, I did not get it. Uh, you know, what was your point? Uh, if you just can repeat. Uh, well, it's just about data management, data processing. Uh, India provides these capabilities to other countries and other companies around uh, countries around the world. But like you said, you want to maintain ownership of your own data, but the data, uh, uh, the data processing and data management deals and, and capabilities you offer to the other world. Yes. That, a country owns its own data. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I think that yes, but, but I mean, uh, I mean, definitely doing outreach with some level of deterrence or some level of uh, reasonable restriction, and uh, to ensure self protection. I think that makes sense, and sure. that's the case. It is, sure. and, yeah. And uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, the thing is that again, uh, I would say that. Uh, you know the broader the broader point is that i mean as i mentioned there that india is a strong link in the supply chain that india is a very big country it has 1.4 billion people it has a lot of uh, you know uh, good skilled and semi skilled population and also it has uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, i mean uh, abilities and capabilities to be uh, to be a part of not only the demand i mean to be a to be a market to uh, you know uh, from the demand uh, in the demand chain mm-hmm. but also in the supply chain mm-hmm. so that is the broader view and within it uh, i mean india's technology journey has started and it has it is doing great but it needs to do more it has it is it has come up with a, different policies so that it can pitch its story and also build the right kind of foundation but uh, i mean uh, but it is still building up sure. uh, to i mean uh, and aiming for a success story sure. yeah you've mentioned a number of times uh, the new policies that uh, the indian government is implementing um uh, so that the these stories implementing these pitches and stories uh, around the world is even more successful. Would you like to share any examples of any particular policies? That yes, yes, yes. I mean, as I said, uh, you know, when it comes to biotechnology, uh, there is this uh, bio E3, bio uh, right. Uh, then there is this national strategy for artificial intelligence. And, is that the uh, AI for all? Yes, AI mm-hmm. for all. Then, um, you know, then there is this, um, for semiconductors, there is ISM. So I see. for uh, all of Which them... Which is the ISM standard? Which is Indian Semiconductor Mission. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, I mean, also uh, uh, building its own uh, foundation and capabilities on the ground mm-hmm. while also making the pitch and opening uh, the channels of dialogue and uh, business with, uh, you know, um, for stakeholders from outside the country mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and pitching itself as a, you know, as a, uh, nodal point of supply chain in in the semiconductor. Sure. I understand. Journey. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank thank you for those examples. Okay. Now pivoting on to something else that you talk about is India's tech diplomacy. So um, especially uh, all of us uh, here at uh, at Danube um, and even at Ludovica, international relations is very important uh, and something that we all uh, study to to some extent. Can you talk about um, India's tech diplomacy as you've been researching and writing on? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned also, I mean, we have actually discussed it, but not on, as the notional concept of tech diplomacy, that how India is trying to use these key advanced technologies to build also its strategic partnerships. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, India has, uh, I mean, India has a very good, uh, I mean, technological agreement with you, the United States for the space technology. It has already, I think, uh, have... Uh, you know, signed uh, different kinds of MOUs or agreements with 61 countries for semiconductors, mm-hmm. you know, US, EU, Taiwan, uh, they have. Uh, so, I mean, I'm saying that, uh, so there is a lot of these things which is happening, uh, which uh, while India is trying to uh, use these uh, technologies while building its strategic partnerships to pitch it uh, that uh, not only to import uh, a certain, you know, certain things where, you know, they can, uh, like, you know, the partnering country can be, countries can be of help to each other uh, for knowledge sharing, Mm -hmm. uh, transfers, joint ventures, and also creating opportunities for each other. Uh, in the commercial front. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, 
completely uh, like all that is under uh, I mean like comes under tech, tech diplomacy. I see. So basically, uh, what you're saying in your paper is that the tech diplomacy is the umbrella with which the the advanced technologies, the key technologies, and those policies, and the 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 national power strategies that anyone to put forth is all under this tech yeah, diplomacy. Yeah. Why only the key technologies? If you come about. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, digital public intro infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This is also a very important uh, element of tech diplomacy, where you are actually, you know, import e exporting your uh, e your capability or knowledge on a certain sector to the other economy, mm -hmm. so that they can adopt something uh, which is cost efficient, which is economic, and which is can be used for ease of living for people. So, which is an uh, which is in the discourse of international interactions, mm -hmm. uh, bilateral. So, I mean, that is also a very important part of technological yes. diplomacy. Yes. And one thing that we're seeing, you know, all over the world that, that countries, um, uh, partnerships and the relationship from country to country, sometimes when um, maybe governments have uh, problems and issues with each other, uh, a way to bridge a gap is to do some uh, some business deals yeah. when you when you when you do business uh, with other governments and other countries. Sometimes that can help bring countries together under this partnership of of commerce and yes. and mutual mutually advantaged um, uh, uh, revenue and capabilities. Yeah. So also, sports diplomacy is a very important uh, aspect on that front. Yeah. Just I mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Yes. A excellent point. Excellent point. Um, so, so those are the main components that we talked about in terms of uh, elements of your of your paper. But are there any other points that you'd like to make before we conclude this this part of the podcast? Uh, I would say that um, I would say that uh, more than more than um, you know making it a case for teaching the world, India is now growing the uh, growing its own uh, foundations of you know pitching for. It, it pitching itself for building a success story in future mm -hmm. and it has to definitely build certain you know certain more as certain more uh, pillars in its own in the domestic front front mm -hmm. which is it is it has already started and it is building uh, also while they are building policies while they are building uh, you know trying to do these outreach programs they are also very aware that uh, technology also requires a lot of skilled uh, you know skilled uh, people I mean workers mm -hmm. skilled workers mm -hmm. so simultaneously it is also coming up with different kinds of training programs different kind of programs so that it can simultaneously build and encourage people to learn I see so, Are these government policies, like new government policies, to to get more uh, education, more skilled uh, training for for the population of India? Yeah, I mean there is private uh, education, there is public education, and there are small uh, diploma or uh, you know, I mean, uh, small uh, training programs which is funded by the government mm. uh, for you know for the skilled population so that they can uh, they can. Uh, and I have my friend, she designs these, you know, these small training programs, skill programs for people who are not maybe who want employment, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, they need some kind of more knowledge and some kind of brush ups, upskill them. Upskilling and so, yeah, so they are also doing this while they are upscaling their pitch. Uh, implementing the policies, they also you know that you know this journey also needs skilled um, workers and skilled populations. So they are also investing on that front. No, that's very important. Thank you for that. Well, so before we conclude, um, just like because I understand you've been in Budapest here for for three months uh, researching this great topic, um, uh, just a little bit about you uh, before we conclude today. Uh, what other topics? Do you uh, have you been writing on, and what other um, big topics have you been uh, working on, uh, both since you've been here in in Hungary, uh, but also before you've been in the in the region for a while? What other main things uh, interest Mimi Roy? Okay, uh, I would say that apart from technology, I have uh, written a paper on uh, you know India's uh, you know the potentials of India's defense relations with the countries of this region. I mean, Hungary, Slovakia, 
then Czech Republic, uh, Poland. India is already, I mean, talking with Poland. It has signed an innovation agreement with Czech Republic. Hungary has all the right things it is doing to pitch for that kind of, uh, you know, uh, dialogue to open up. Uh, so I've explored a paper on that. I have also written a little bit on, uh, I mean, written a policy, a paper on a small commentary on, uh, you know, the potentials of India-Hungary bilateral relations, which I see can grow, uh, you know, which I see can grow. We have a diaspora here. We have common shared interest and also shared threats, which might be maybe um, transboundary. Uh, mm-hmm. and Between Hungary and India. Yeah, I mean, in the area of cyber, in the area of technology, in the area of, uh, you know, I mean, in internal security or, I mean, security, there are uh, aspects which are artificial intelligence. These are like areas of interest or mutual concerns, rather, I would say, where, you know, they can start having dialogues. And, and then uh, something that interested me a lot, and I have been actually, uh, you know, made all my points, just uh, I have to put it all across on paper about, you know, connectivity strategy. I mean, Hungary mm-hmm. is has a very, very important and uh, very... Uh, very uh, a kind of uh, popular strategy, economic policy of economic neutrality, which they call it connectivity. Connectivity, strategy. yes. Famously in in uh, Balash Orban's book, Hazar uh, Sarkat, he talks about connectivity. Yeah, and it is very important. Uh, you know why? Because in uh, most of the countries now talk a lot about protectionism, uh, mm-hmm. while you know, this entire major power business, like, you know, I mean, trade competition has. Mm -hmm. And now with Trump coming to power, there is already a lot of discussion about how protectionism will become more intense. Mm -hmm. So it's a breather Mm -hmm. in the backdrop of, you know, this kind of protectionism debate going on that Mm -hmm. actually Hungary has come out and it's a very bold language to you know not care about the major power rhetoric about uh, protectionism but to put your case across uh, of economic neutrality mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, as and a, it's been very successful i think for hungary the, this yeah. connectivity strategy yeah uh, as a, it's it's a strategy a posture of strategic autonomy so i am i intend to put it across i have already I mean, like you know it's a uh, it's in pipeline and, uh, you know, I mean, um, um, then uh, India-Central Europe historical ties because uh, also uh, we have a huge uh, geographical distance. But the, our historical ties makes us more mentally intimate and uh, find us those nodal points to connect with each other so that we have not only business, defense and these very ongoing uh, aspects for, uh, you know, growing our, growing, you know, bringing the region together, but also use uh, our historical ties to understand the commonalities in our thought process, mm-hmm. culture, you know, and history. Mm-hmm. So uh, one I'm uh, doing on that and uh, definitely, and one I will be, I mean, I've been just, uh, you know, been offered to write two more papers. One which I've been, I will be writing more on uh, the, you know, on Eurasia, how, you know, I mean, Central Asia is something, a very important region as a linking region between Asia and Europe. Yes. So how, I mean, how, uh, you know, how India is looking at Central Asia and where EU is also a very important player. Yes. This. And I had a very uh, discussion with a colleague to uh, work on India-EU relations, the present trajectory. So all this is under process. Okay. So, yeah. So this is these are the things that I've worked on. Uh, yes. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like it's, you've been very busy and will continue to stay very busy. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, that pretty soon your fellowship uh, with Ludovica here in Budapest uh, will, will come to an end. So I, I ask, what is, what is next for Mimi Roy? What, what do you aspire and like to do uh, next? Um, right now, I have been working more independently in my country. I'm affiliated to certain institutes. I'm working remotely with them. But since uh, I've explored this region a bit, uh, not only this time, this is my third time actually. I in want, Budapest. In Budapest. I want to uh, keep exploring and find more opportunities in this part of the world and, uh, and, and would uh, like if given an opportunity 
add to the discourse. So that's the plan. So I'm already, you know, trying to uh, explore the network and work through, uh, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, opportunities and see if anything is there for me here. I say, well, I wish you great luck. And I'm sure our, our listeners, our viewers uh, have enjoyed uh, the information you share with us today. And we wish you luck in your your future endeavors and uh, and hope that you'll come back some someday in the future. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Mimi. And thank you, Danube. And thank you, Ludovica. Cheers. All right. Thanks. Thanks.